This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcaster Orion Samuelson and yours truly, Max Armstrong, and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, inflation in the nation is on our minds right now. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to our weekly visit here. And it's a pleasure to be alongside Mr. Pearson this weekend right at the desk. Yeah, it's good to see you in person again, Max. Farmers are thinking about a lot of things right now. And if you talk to the leaders of their organizations, you get a good feel for what's on the minds of farmers and ranchers out across the countryside. Well, each October, the National Corn Growers Association names their new leadership. And this year, Chris Edgington, a farmer from St. Ansgar, Iowa, moves into that president's role. Chris, you're finishing out your first week. How's it been? It's been good. Yep, done several interviews and still trying to be a farmer at the same time. Well, that's the truth. It's a busy time of year for you in a lot of different respects. But Chris, as you look out over this next year, what are some of the priorities you're going to be pursuing as head of NCGA? Well, you know, our priorities oftentimes stay fairly similar. We're always trying to increase demand uh, for our great product. We are, we're trying to protect farmer profitability. And we're just trying to um, showcase some of the sustainability efforts that we've been working on probably this next year. Um, well, at the same time, we'll be talking about ethanol and WOTUS and, and you know, Farm Bill's not far off. So we got a lot to do. Yeah, that is no lie. There is always something going on. Chris, I know that communicating with folks in Washington, D.C. is a huge part of that job. And of course, with the new administration, there's always questions about what the leadership's going to look like. And EPA, of course, is a big part of uh, corn growers' lives. Have you been able to have any contact with Michael Regan at the head of EPA yet? You know, interestingly, but the, um, the very first call I happened to have was with him. And uh, Things went well. Um, it's it's a it's an interesting relationship we have at EPA because they are in so many facets of what we do within the side of that agency, whether it's water, ethanol, um, regulations, and so there's always something where sometimes we're in agreement and sometimes we're in disagreement. That's the truth. And did you get the sense in your conversation that he was willing to listen and, and open to uh, some of the concerns coming from the corn growers? I thought so. We had a very open, frank conversation when we talked, and and that's how he wants to be. He told he told us he wants to be open. He wants to to have those kind of conversations, and you know he, he says that uh, they want to get things back on track and move forward. We don't know yet exactly what that means because there's been very little come out. Um, but you know the first thing we talked about was the RVOs, and that 15 billion gallons should be 15 billion gallons. And so they're still waiting on that. He says the numbers are in a different office being worked on uh, from their first proposal, and then there'll be a comment period. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a relationship that we try to grow um, every time. Let's definitely keep those lines of communication open. Well, Chris, we wish you the best of luck in your role as president of the NCGA. Thanks for talking to us today. You're welcome. Thank you. And the cost of doing business aren't just on the minds of corn growers. The people who milk cows are a little bit worried about inflation, too. Those higher feed costs are something they have to watch. Tanner Emke with CoBank visited with me about that the other day as we were with him at World Dairy Expo in Wisconsin. We all know the story here that's been ongoing for quite some time. You've got uh, a lot of cost inflation on feed. and. Uh, that is uh, the story I think that's not going anywhere anytime soon. That's really compressing margins. And uh, we recently had the Farm Credit Dairy Forum uh, in Chicago, and we talked about this at length, about what's the margin environment right now for dairy. And if you are one of those uh, farms that is profitable, margins uh, may be profitable, but they're quite thin, uh, very thin right now because of the cost of uh, feed uh, compared to where we are with milk prices. Uh, but it's not just feed, as we all know, it's uh, labor. The ongoing saga in all of agriculture, but always dairy, a situation we've always uh, struggled with, especially now. If you can find labor, you're paying 20 to $25 uh, per hour for labor, and uh, those are not sustainable rates, and so that's why a lot of uh, producers of all sizes now, uh, small, medium, even large producers, are looking at robotics and automation. Uh, and then, of course, and then we've got uh, 
other costs for construction if you want to expand your farm, build a new uh, parlor or expand uh, if you uh, add more stalls or build uh, anything new on the farm that's going to require steel, uh, aluminum, lumber, cement, uh, it's going to cost you. And so uh, with all of this cost inflation really uh, squeezing dairy producers right now, all of those expansion plans are being put on hold and repenciled. And that's why we're seeing uh, cow numbers having plateaued uh, nationwide. And why we think going forward, we're going to continue to see that cost pressure uh, squeeze the cow herd and why we're probably uh, not going to see a significant rise in, cow, in the U.S. cow herd anytime soon. Those dairy farms with the best margins right now, if there are margins of profitability, tend to be the larger farms. They have the scale, as Tanner Emke pointed out to me, and they may not have considered robotics in the past. Those larger farms of uh, thousands of cows are definitely doing the math uh, because, again, this labor crisis is forcing farmers to go back and look at this autumn. Uh, we'll, we'll look at where they can find automation on the farm, and labor absolutely has to be one of those. And so, or robotics is going to be one of the one of the resolutions to uh, uh, the labor crisis, and so they have to look at it. Uh, whereas traditionally in the past they have not. Tanner MK with CoBank told us there at the World Dairy Expo that when you combine the fact that the global demand for dairy is strong right now with the lack of expansion of the U.S. dairy herd, the prospects for improved bullishness in that milk price picture improve as we go through this year. And it's time to dig into those markets. We're joined this week by Tommy Grizafi from Advanced Trading. And Tommy, we'll get to corn and beans and cattle here in just a second. But I know inflation has been on your mind. I want to get your thoughts first and foremost. What do you see happening in the energy markets? Crude oil and natural gas. What's going on? Well, if you're active in these markets, it's uh, you're not getting a lot of sleep at night. It's like having a newborn child or a little puppy. They're moving uh, very dynamic. Crude oil almost touched $80 this week. Nat gas has a six in front of it. Of course, as we know, to make fertilizer, nat gas is a very important component. So the whole energy sector is absolutely on fire. Uh, I'm down to putting uh, ethanol, as high ethanol blend as my car will take. I'm sure the farmers like to hear that, but I'm done paying 350 gas. So back to E85 we go. Uh, markets are on fire. And actually, speaking of ethanol, those guys are doing okay again, even with this high priced corn. So the energy markets are on fire. That ties into corn. Uh, as Senator John Hoven always says, food, fuel, and fiber, absolutely all three of those are on. Fire. The only one not exploding up is grains, but of course, we're in the gut slot of harvest. We'd expect a little pressure. Yeah, yeah, I think you're exactly right about that. Tommy, with the energy, before we move off that topic, do you see a correction coming? Are we going to get a break in these prices before or maybe after winter? We, we had a little pullback here in the last 48 hours. Uh, crude went from 80 to 76. And uh, the, only, the only way to make a bigger fool on, your, on this show than predicting corn prices would be to predict crude prices. But you know, Mike, when we talk corn, we actually have a chance because we can see it, we can feel it, we can touch it. When we talk energies, we have all this great energy here in the United States, but we're not using it. And that's another subject for another show. But we have all this great energy. We're not running out of energy. Of course, there'll be corrections, but to the to the end user, the risk is that the market goes up. So uh, add, add fuel is one of those inputs that's absolutely exploding. I think people will be surprised when they go to look at inputs, what they are next year. Of course, you know, everyone's talking about it, So, but it is real. It sure is. Tommy, let's talk about the green markets there. We have seen some impressive sales this week to our neighbor to the south, Mexico stepping in, making some good sized purchases of corn and soybeans as we prepare for next week's supply and demand estimates from USDA. Tommy, do you think that foreign export demand is going to stay strong? I hope it does, Mike. We need more of it. We need to see these daily sales. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, of everything to export. But when it comes to corn and beans, as this last USDA report showed, we're starting to have a little bit more stuff, especially soybeans. You look at the meal market, uh, absolutely at uh, multi-month and lows. So the meal's cheap. The, the truth, Mike, is they're, they're crushing these beans for the oil. And so the, the story is the oil sector, canola, canola oil. I hope exports stay good, but we have an oil market like I've never seen in my life. And I think that's the big story. All right, something to watch going forward. Tommy, harvest is underway. Are you hearing any yield surprises for either corn or soybeans? 
I am, and they're probably going to smack me for telling you, but the beans, I drove through uh, Minnesota in Iowa this week visiting with clients, and then we drove through Rochester. I stopped by a couple farms up there we work with, and they, they were smiling. So that's all I can say about that, my friend. They were smiling. All right. Well, certainly something to keep a look on. We'll dig deeper into what's happening in the commodity markets when we return with Tommy Grazafi here in just a moment on This Week in Agribusiness. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by AgriGold, your seed ally in the field with unparalleled options that perform on your farm. Learn more at agrigold.com. And we're back talking markets with Tommy Grazafi from Advanced Trading. Tommy, I was taking a look at that November soybean chart earlier, and boy, that is a three-month slide to the downside. Tommy, are we getting near a bottom in November beans? We had a nice rally this week. We're giving back a little bit. Um, the market I'd like to see bottom to give us a little signal would be soybean meal. And personally, I bought a little soybean meal this week and it didn't work out so well. So we might not be there yet. But I'll tell you this, Mike, in the next few weeks, watch that cash market. Growers out there, watch your, watch your local cash market, that basis. If that starts to pop, then we'll see what we'd call a harvest low. I think coming into the weekend, we'll be about 50, 60 percent done in soybeans and then We'll see what the markets do after that. We're going to need more demand. The yields are there in, in, in the I states, from what I can see. Obviously, I'm up in North Dakota right now. The yields aren't here, but uh, that's the story, right? North Dakota and Canada, Montana, drought, I states, uh, rains came just in time, really made a nice crop. Well, Tommy, I want to look uh, on the corn side as well. We saw just about a month ago, early September, corn December contract dip down, touch that $5 mark, and then it's been fairly resilient since then. Are you okay saying the, the harvest low, so to speak, is in on this corn crop? Regionally in North Dakota, I could say it is. And the reason when I look at the cash market here down the street, uh, we're even with the board, okay? So it's harvest, I'm in North Dakota, it's spot. You can sell corn at 540-535. So up here, we don't have the bushels. Now, regionally, when you get down to our clients in Iowa, as they finish down with soybeans and they hit that corn, if that corn's a little better and they run out of space, of course, that corn's going to go to town. And basis-wise, you could see that widen out. And then once we hit that harvest low, everyone out there needs to know there's a lot of money in the world and it's looking for a home. We're not going to have another crop in America for another 12 months. So we're close. I'm not quite sure we're there from the futures point from that 497, Mike. I don't see us going down there right away. And that is because of fertilizer and what it's doing to the December 22 corn, which has been rallying recently. So keep an eye on your DS 22, no 22 corn bean spread, Mike. All right. Well, you know, we talk about the corn prices sliding, but even if they've come down a little bit, end users, particularly livestock producers, Tommy, are still in a little bit of a lurch. Let's talk about the cattle market. What do you see happening with beef prices here in the short term? Well, one interesting thing that uh, when I was golfing yesterday, of course, big business trip here in North Dakota Banker Association golf, but I was with a banker who uh, lends money to cattle folks, and he said it's only folks in trouble are actually a few ranchers and that just breaks my heart so we, we don't have enough processing power to get these animals processed and we need to uh, we need to get workers back working so there's no shortage of cattle but when you look at the price on the counter it's so high we have a labor problem in america and it doesn't seem to be going away the new minimum wage is now 16 17 dollars an hour if you so choose to work that's true. That is something we've definitely seen climbing, which should put a few more dollars in people's pockets, which should help keep beef prices elevated. Right, Tommy? One would think. Uh, I know when I go to Costco or a local store, I'm, I'm in sticker shock. I'm back to eating pork and chicken, so those guys are happy. Uh, we're more of a ground beef economy here, or a person right now. Last night, I went to a wonderful steak restaurant in Bismarck. They were out of five of the six steaks they choose. So we have a supply problem. We have a, a problem getting it to the end user. We have a labor shortage. It's just absolutely incredible what's happening in America. It sure is. Tommy Grizafi from Advanced Trading. Thanks for joining us. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next. Brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. He's out there in the pursuit of technology every week, trying to relate it to the agriculture community and how these advances are coming along and need to be implemented on our farms. 
and one is as simple as the iPhone. You bet Chad Colby has the brand spanking new one. I just got my brand new iPhone, and I can't wait to talk about it. Hi, everyone. I'm Chad Colby. You can see my two phones right there. The one on the right is the previous model, the 12 Pro, and the one on the left is the new 13 Pro Max. Now, the Pro Max is that bigger size. I also grabbed a glass protective shield for it. I go with the Apple cases. I grabbed an Apple leather case for it. But what I want to talk about a little bit is the raw performance. If you're not familiar with where we are in the history, if you're using an iPhone 7, 8, or 9, those kind of phones, there's a huge upgrade just to the 12. But when you get to the 13, it really unlocks a tremendous amount of power. You go out to any website like 9to5Mac and look at, they're going to start talking about already some of the reviews of this machine. You go out to Mac Rumors and you start understanding really quickly this is a completely redesigned phone. Now, when you go out to Apple's website and look, the new 13 comes in four models. You can see all the way over to the left, the little guy, that's the mini, the smaller model. You've got the regular 13 and then you've got the two pros. Now, you can tell visibly there the pros have the better cameras. We'll get to that in a minute. The two 13s, they've got a lot of new features. A lot of it has to do with the camera, but they've also got that new A15 processor, improved battery, and also that super fast 5G. The pros get a little bit more enhanced with a better screen that's about 30% brighter and some better optics. And wow, are they ever with 50% more light in these pro models. Look at the job this does in the dark of night. I was playing with it a little bit more here, this little shot of my 560, and let me tell you, this thing is super impressive. You're going to be seeing a lot more videos coming from my phone this year on these tech segments. Max, I know you picked up a new phone right away as well. What do you think of the new iPhone? You know, it is remarkable to see the advance of technology that Chad talks about every week here. I made the comment to him the other day that this new iPhone probably has within it the computing power that they had in NASA's mission control back in the 60s. I'm pleased Chad was able to follow the lead of some of us and get his now. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. We like to visit with farm broadcast colleagues across the country. And Mike, one guy who really watches what's going on right there in the central part of Minnesota is Joe Gill. It's KASM Radio. KASM, Albany, Minnesota. Uh, I guess you guys would say, hey, tune over our way, drop into the chasm. Do you say that? Yeah, you can. We're, I always say we're in the belly button of the state, and that leads to an awkward conversation. So I'm now trying to refrain from doing that. So <laughs> I just missed you at World Dairy Expo the other day. I didn't have a chance to visit with you. I know you were there. What were you hearing from some of the folks, especially from your region, who had cows there or were attending otherwise? You know, first of all, I think like everything else, people were glad to be back after a year off at World Dairy. But I think a lot of folks were there, one, I think, just to be around other like-minded people in the dairy industry. And that's what I heard. You know, we were fortunate because in this area, fall has been outstanding. So they didn't have to worry about chopping corn or doing really any other need to do or necessary field work. They were able to come out and enjoy the show a lot. There were a few folks from other countries. Their attendance was a little bit sparse, but as you pointed out, one thing you really noticed was that uh, that networking opportunity and and we talk about that a lot but there really is value at an event of this nature as producers get together and exchange ideas isn't there yeah you mentioned the international perspective and i always get a kick out of that when you walk around and you hear the different conversations and some you can't understand but i was told over 40 i think uh, different countries were represented this year at the show and even had some uh, cattle from Canada there this year. So that's a big part of the show. I know this year they had some uh, education and work workshops in, in Spanish uh, this year, which was big. And we see a lot of our uh, dairy farm employees and, and that really helped as they discussed a lot of topics to make them more successful on a farm too. The milk price could be better, but it certainly could be worse, I guess you could say, right? Oh yeah, a lot of dairy economists, and that was a lot of conversation during the days at World Dairy 2 on what are we gonna see in the future? What's gonna change in the milk marketing order and some of these ways how we factor the price of milk and uh, especially this area where we see a lot of this milk going towards cheese. 
a lot of questions, but, but very little answers right now. Joe, when we think about the dairy industry, they're dealing with these higher feed prices and farmers are out there trying to get that corn out of the field. How's harvest running up in your part of the state? You know, as I mentioned, we've been dry, so to get out in the field has been nice, but we were hampered by that drought specifically in our area. So we have a lot of corn silage. I haven't seen a lot of combines going right now, but we've had some farmers that said uh, filling their silos, uh, filling their egg bags, uh, they're 40 to 50 percent below where they were a year ago and that's forcing uh, some farmers you mentioned that added expense uh, going out to neighbors and saying hey can we purchase uh, some of your corn or, or even hey we've been very short and like our friends to our east when it comes to a good dairy quality alfalfa. You know, Joe, the other thing about your area there in west central Minnesota, when you look at your geography, you have so much ag manufacturing. What's the general health of the region there in your part of the state? You know, I, it, overall, I think we're hanging in there is the best way to put it right now. Like you said, it's, it's an interesting area to live in, and I haven't lived anywhere else, so I have nothing to compare it to. But I think industry wise, you know, we are seeing some growth, which which may catch a few folks off center a bit, but we're seeing uh, folks uh, continuing to be optimistic and even growing, whether it's uh, egg business or, or dairy farms in general. You know, one of the things that comes with that growth is a demand for labor. I heard from the Dairy Expo that uh, labor saving devices were popular. What's the, the labor health outlook? You know, I can get you a job milking cows in about five minutes. Uh, I got a few of those phone numbers uh, right here and they come almost uh, daily. We have a segment on our programming where, where people, if you're looking, you know, like a swap shop, you know, trying to sell or buy something, we're starting to get even more and more, hey, do you want to milk cows, whether it's part-time or, or full-time. And we're just seeing that in general with all employment with our area businesses. Uh, you can pretty much fall out of your car and run into four businesses that have a help on it sign out there. Joe, in so many states, farmers uh, have to watch closely what's happening in the big city of their states. Uh, we often see that. Is that the case in, in Minnesota, too? I mean, it's hard to ignore what's happening in the Twin Cities, isn't it? Because of the ripple effect on the rural economy elsewhere in the state. You know, I think uh, the big word would be frustration, maybe a little confusion. Seems like there's some mixed messages. Um, but what we hear, and even like at World Dairy Expo too, it's, it's consumers demanding such and such or demanding this. And I think from a producer standpoint saying either one, we already do it, or two, well, didn't you want this just a little while ago and how has that changed now? So. It seems like it's a, an ever moving target. And from a producer standpoint, there's some frustration building right there. Uh, trying to meet the consumer needs. And then there's the politics that often spills over out of the big cities into the rural counties of many of our states. And I would imagine Minnesota falls into that category too, doesn't it? Yeah, Max, you can count on one hand how many of our state legislators have a direct link yeah. to agriculture. So that's brought up a lot. We're pretty fortunate the ones in our local area have that direct connection, but that's the fight. So a lot of our uh, statewide egg organizations do a wonderful job trying to link the two together down in St. Paul. Well, I always appreciate the chance to visit with you, sir. We look forward to seeing you at the Farm Broadcasters meeting in a few days. Sounds great. We appreciate it. Thanks again. Joe Gill on the radio, Albany, Minnesota, joining us this weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. He's at KASM Radio. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. While we see much of the nation, I have a few favorite states, and this one is one of my favorites. I've been in Missouri a couple of times in the past month. Putting together the Plan Smart Grow Smart series from BASF, Max has been talking to farmer Andy Cap about the return that fungicides provide for his operation. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Revex, Revitec, Veltima. Some people look at fungicides as, as an investment sure. in that harvest uh, that's to come, and they look for a return on investment. Do yes. you approach it that way too? Absolutely, and farming is a lot about that. You can spend a lot of dollars that have a promise of great return, but 
again, we've talked about being able to prove the return from fungicide applications. And without a doubt, I think they'll return. Talk a little bit about BASF, what you know about them, what, you, what your experience has been, and, and as, you, as you look at these products, some of the considerations that come into play. Our BASF has come to me through our independent local crop protection supplier, and he had a great relationship with our previous rep and, and had him out on the farm many times and became a good asset. Just the knowledge and the ability, these guys that travel and look at these products and their performance all year is, is a whole deeper dive than I'm able to do and, and a lot more geography that I'm able to get out and take a look at. When you're harvesting, do you work extra hard at just uh, checking what you're doing as you go? I mean, there's so many things to be concerned about, but do you watch crop performance uh, uh, intently as you're harvesting? Absolutely. Um, crop performance and yield is what we're out here for, uh, bring dollars back into the operation. So we intend to keep our equipment calibrated and working straight um, and then watching varieties as we harvest different treatments as we've harvested and even marking those as as you go through the field making notes so you can go back and pull the maps out later and and see what has happened of course there are different ways to approach fungicide utilization some people will uh, just wait uh, to do a, a preventative step there others uh, will look at it and say you know what uh, I just want this to be a part of my operation all the time, each year. What's your step? How, how do you approach that, Andy? So as we have developed, um, probably in the last five and six years, it is certainly more of a part of our plan. Um, it, is, it will be in our budget when we start. I would save it for the most productive fields, but absolutely it's part of the plan that will get started in the winter and it'll come through. Do you think your experience of this year with that income potential that you wanted to maximize will guide you a little bit uh, increasingly in the future? Likely it will. As we continue and see value in these products, I think we'll continue to have them in our program and, and in our budgets. To learn more and see the rest of that series, visit PlantSmartGrowSmart.com and stick with us. Next week, we'll be talking to a farmer from North Carolina as a part of the series. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at PivotBio.com. We looked at the week ahead with Greg Solier's help. Sir, I know there's still a lot of fire concern. Yep. They had one they were worried about north of Rapid City this past week, and I think that was propelled with a strong wind. Yeah, that's right, at 90 degree heat. Here we are in almost mid-October, and we've been peddling some of those readings into sections of uh, the northern plains. But yeah, looky here, the weatherman's put down much colder, colder, and a sizable trough, so there's more wind on the front side, but significant moisture on the back side and the colder of a couple of weather systems to come ashore into the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. Livestock managers, this will be a pretty dramatic shift, by the way. Montana, the Dakotas, and points on southward. And more moisture to come in the form of accumulating snow. Snow levels will be dropping, along with freezing temperatures as well, into the high plains areas of Montana and Wyoming. And here's even that rain snow mix outside of Rapid City. Probably some accumulating snow there. There will be some organized rains into parts of Nebraska. Cooler to colder air and some frost and freeze potential, would you believe, will limit Valley Rogue River Basin later on into the week. Here's the extent of that trough for now. Fairly weak and benign over the desert southwestern part of the country. A couple of thunderstorms into the warmth and a wind of the central and southern plains. We've had recent moisture to help out those winter wheat fields and there is more to come with those winter wheat fields in mind. Uneven emergence and it's been really just dusting in that crop of late. But look at the moisture with showers and thunderstorms central and southern plains. A little snow in the Nebraska Panhandle. Some snow across the central Rockies. Much colder air and some gusty winds as well in the desert southwest. A real shocker to the system, Max, a man and beast there later in the week. Some of our friends in the cattle business have been roughed up by these seasonal transitions. And when you talk about much colder and snow, we have to wonder. You're not talking about a blizzard like. I don't think so. Not a blizzard. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that, though, as the weeks wear on here. The next couple of weeks, it is looking wintry. You'll see that in the extended outlook. Uh, but yeah, probably some tough footing anticipated as well, not to mention the temperature drop, which is still pretty mild and summer like, and a couple of showers. Eastern 
Quorum Belt, some slight cooling for the northern plains. Pretty quiet start to the week across the northern central plains until the late portion of the week. Big trough forms up here, developing low outside of Rapid City, Custer Edgemont, snow on its backside, wind and rain through the western Corn Belt drought areas. Eastern areas should be able to make some good progress still middle to late parts of the week with a summer field continuing on along with those high and elevated dew points. Been in barn managers plan accordingly. Showers and thunderstorms into the Delta region. Peanut and cotton, uh, cotton harvest is delayed there. There's some heat for Texas, uh, but a big cool down. Uh, maybe a blue norther comes into that to the state with gusty winds, a drop in temperatures on the front side of the system. Showers and thunderstorms could trend heavy and severe at this uh, October calendar date max across parts of the southeastern plains. The leaf peepers in the east. What will the weather be like for them? And pretty nice to get out and enjoy it. A couple of rain showers around, but uh, overall it'll be a pretty good go of it. Remember now we've had a good part of the uh, summer season dryness and drought. Not sure how the colors will play out here. Probably pretty vivid across the Great Lakes region. Note the low making its way and developing over the western Corn Belt. There'll be some delays and a pickup on moisture here. Summer warm for the eastern complex. Good moisture reduction and right down values. And again, lots of sunshine, high pressure over the northeast of New England. Southeastern states, warmth and humidity and more rain. It came down in buckets over the Gulf Coast areas and uh, parts of the southern mid-Atlantic region. Last week, this will be a slow moving low. Jet stream winds are in from the west and southwest and the end result later in the week. Showers and thunderstorms could trend heavy and severe from the delta back westward and much cooler and colder on the move there. Greg Sonia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, we know producers who've made some remarkable progress during this harvest season. What do we see in the week ahead now? Let's check with Greg Solier for the rain amounts on your map. Uh, and it's been those western Corn Belt locales making a good advance and leading the pack on harvest. But then again, in the midst of a drought ridden setup here, you probably don't have much to speak of. But probably where the more significant delays play out here, maybe upwards of a half an inch or maybe a little more in some pockets. The eastern areas should be in relatively good shape. Scattered rainfall over the southeastern part of the country. We'll keep an eye down here. Texas, Oklahoma, back into the upper Midwest. Even this this October calendar date says can still generate severe weather. The good news, the big news, the headline news, one to two inches of water equivalency, northern California, Pacific Northwest, northern and central Rockies, and max only the beginning here as we head through the next few weeks. So significant improvement coming out of the west. What about temperatures for the week of October 18th? Uh, right now we continue on with warmth and it's almost of a late summertime style eastern corn belt into the northeast of New England. Look at the cool air all the way down to the desert southwest and here's that U-shaped configuration and a tight compaction of the isotherm of the range from above to below on temperatures, so there ought to be moisture. And yes, there will be and probably some harvest delays, not the way the rest of the season goes, but it will be of significance here. The moisture over the northern and central plains, Pacific Northwest, Northern California, all the way down to the southeastern states. We may tap a little tropical moisture in here. Dry time for the northeast of New England and down to Texas ways as well. Well, the final days of October, many of our agritourism folks will be finishing up their pumpkin sales, moving the apples that they have. How does the weather look and how warm will it be then? Uh, nothing too spooky on temperatures. If uh, with that in mind here, especially from about the Mississippi on to the east, still a little late summer feel in the air. The cool air is present. The chill is present, but nothing out of control. Still the trough as well running from the southwestern states into the western Great Lakes a region where we still have uh, moisture of concern, not really concern of good news, maybe concern with lowering snow levels again. Pacific Northwest, Northern California, Despite this trough here, uh, precip should be a bit below average here, but still some through the heartland wet weather kind of uh, dropping, at least robbing this system here across the eastern part of the United States. That is a tropical feature still that needs to be watched here across the uh, western Atlantic later hmm. in the month. Still watching tropical features. We got into that first week of November. Will we still see that big temperature division? Uh, we for right now, uh, see it. yes, we do. Here it is. And, and, and this is of concern. And probably the way the wintertime goes, this will be transitory. Move Moving, not locked in here, but note the cool and cold air across much of the northern and central and western United States as the warmth moves offshore and a stormy weather picture. Here comes the first uh, snows of the season for the upper Midwest, Great Lakes region, widespread moisture for the Corn Belt, delays both on harvest and of course with severe weather in mind. Keep an eye on that too. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. And the tractor said this weekend it's a tractor that sparks many memories for the man in Missouri who owns it. 
and maybe has sparked some interest in the future for the young people who worked on it. Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. Someone asked me the other day, do they really look that good in person? I assure you, and they are very sturdy in person. Storelock.com is where you get more information. Dan Brinkman in Missouri remembers vividly his Uncle Jim owning this massive Ferguson 180. He would ride with Uncle Jim on that tractor many times, Dan said, and that tractor always managed to stay in the family. Dan Brinkman is now an instructor at Four Rivers Career Center in Washington, Missouri, teaching an auto technology class and as a way to motivate students to achieve higher standards, they have a night shift class that they formed. The class is completely voluntary by the students and the instructor. They meet two nights a week and that's where they restored Dan's Massey 180. It does look so good. If you get to Perryville, Missouri, you can see it in that splendid American tractor museum I've been telling you about. A Massey Ferguson 180 owned by Dan Brinkman at Washington, Missouri. Well, you can go online. You don't have to go in person to see what they're selling at Big Iron Auctions. Mark Stock brings us that update. Hello, Max. Our October 13th auction features just over 900 items. An Oak Wind Manufacturing Company out of St. Elmo, Illinois. They've got a 2019 Oak Wind Seed Treater that will sell. Plus, they've got some three-point equipment. They've got a pair of 2019 Oak Wind Brush Clipping Rakes. These things are 36-inch height. They are five feet wide. Plus, they've got a smaller one that is also selling. So support the Oak Wind Manufacturing Company. Also, Ferris Farms. They're selling 82 items. They're from Grofton, South Dakota. They've got a 1984 GMC Brigadier tandem axle grain truck. They've got an international grain truck and a white GMC semi truck tractor. Check out their Oliver 1555 tractor selling as well. Also, Kermit Grother is retiring. He's got 36 items selling in America's Kansas. He's got an Oliver tractor as well. Plus, Russ Draught is retiring. He's from Clarkson, Nebraska. He's got a John Deere 956 Moco windrower. Plus, they've got a John Deere. 6620 combine and a Tempty Super Hopper grain trailer. Plus, we've got items selling all over the country, including a Caterpillar 311 excavator in Champaign, Illinois. There's an Apache AS1020 self propelled sprayer selling in Bloom, Kansas. And there's a Case International 2188 combine selling out of Greensburg, Indiana. Great lineup of equipment selling on the October 13th Big Iron Auction. The FFA Chapter Tribute is sponsored by Nationwide, the number one farm insurer in the country. To register your FFA Chapter, go to NationwideSupportsFFA.com. That's NationwideSupportsFFA.com. Nationwide, we stand for you. This Week in Agribusiness is proud to salute the FFA, and lately we've been getting to know the Indiana State Officer Team, and we're going to keep that going this week. Joining us is Abigail Stockwish. She is the Southern Region State Vice President, and Abigail, you're heading into this new school year, or it's underway. What are you most excited about? I would say more than anything, just getting to know the members from across the state. You know, the past few months, we've been doing a lot of work at our state fair, um, traveling the state for chapter visits, um, hosting conferences for a lot of our members, and getting to make those baseline connections with our members has been so important and impactful, but I'm really looking forward to continuing to grow with them throughout this year and to take those initial meetings and those initial um, connections with those members and continuing to grow those relationships and just see where they take us throughout the year. So Abigail, what was it that got you excited about FFA when you first joined? Yeah, well, so my family is a traditional production ag family. So I grew up on a hog and livestock farm as well as some diversified crop production. Um, however, as much as I loved ag, I wasn't super involved on the farm and I was really, really interested in finding my own place within the agricultural world. So once I joined FFA, my freshman year of high school, it was actually my advisor was the one that got me super interested in FFA. Even though my family was very strong ag background, it was my advisor that got me excited. And it's just a really good opportunity to continue to be an FFA. That's fantastic. And of course, you're on your year of service to the Indiana FFA right now. Abigail, we wish you the best of luck in the future. Thank you. Now, Samuelson says, insight and commentary 
from Ori and Samuelson. I want to share with you a story that we see all too often at this time of the year in farms and ranches across the country. I quote the story that Kay Shipman wrote in the weekly Farm Bureau magazine. All ages gathered early Wednesday to support Matt Rogie's family in the most practical way, helping his brothers and farm partners Aaron and Philip harvest their soybeans in Cass County, Illinois. Theirs was a heartfelt tribute to the late 44-year-old farmer. Although fully vaccinated against COVID by April, Matt Rogi contracted a breakthrough case and was hospitalized for only 14 hours before he passed away. That according to his widow, Jill, who also was fully vaccinated. Don't let this keep you from getting vaccinated because it is a probably best way to fight the COVID-19 situation. But this kind of a story happens this year and every year in farm communities across the country. For whatever reason, the farmer passes away, his neighbors join in to help. That's part of the good news story that we see in rural America. Oh, I'm sure it happens in cities as well, but it's more commonplace in rural America for neighbors and family of those who have passed away to get together to harvest their crop because timing is such a critical factor. Thanks to Kay Shipman for the story and keep an eye out for similar stories in your area. Coming up, lending is a huge part of agriculture. Keir Rennick from Farm Op Capital will join us to talk about new options in that game. Many growers are in the harvest season. Many are doing some tillage. Some are doing some fertilization. And for quite a few, it's borrowing season already. From Farm Op Capital, Chief Financial Officer, Farm Op Capital, Kira Rennick joins us here this weekend. You are, in fact, lending some money already, aren't you? We are. We, we started in August, actually. We've uh, renewed quite a few loans already from uh, the 21 season. We always ask, uh, what's the tenor of the, the borrowers? How do they feel? Uh, what are you hearing from them right now, Kira? I think for the most part, our borrowers feel really good, um, in part because of where prices are, uh, but two, because we are renewing uh, farmers early, we are locking in their hedging program today, which um, is still a reflection of, of higher prices. So it's a benefit of not only getting earlier uh, purchasing discounts, but also locking in you know, typically north of $5 prices. The liking of those prices and input costs are a concern right now, too. Sure, sure. They certainly are. Kira, how can Farm Op Capital work with growers to take advantage of some of those early season discounts? Yeah, today, I mean, it, it really is about um, the hedging and the risk management program, putting that in place so we can have a more flexible loan to enable them to access uh, funds in August and September. Could you talk a little bit about how the hedging works? Do, do growers go out and handle that on their own, or is that something you handle internally at Farm Op? It's not something we handle. We, we have a preferred network of CTAs, but also um, borrowers can bring their own CTA. But it is, it's essentially a strategy that's crafted between them and their advisor, and then we value it. So I want to ask you, inflation is in the news. It's come up a couple of times on the show so far. When inflation starts to go up, interest rates become a concern. Kier, what are you expecting over this next year? What are you keeping an eye on? You know, over the next two years, if you look at the data, there really isn't a lot of pressure on rates going up. I think it's, it is Fed policy driven, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball, but if you, if you look at where most of the market is anticipating potential volatility, um, and a slower um, recovery from, from the pandemic, the rate pressure isn't, uh, isn't there. When we're thinking of operating capital, when we're thinking of, of operating notes that are carrying through the season, uh, a lot of folks are, when times are bad, looking to extend those. What type of capability does farm op capital have for flexibility on uh, making sure farmers are maximizing their borrowed dollars? 
Yeah, so typically we don't extend. Uh, we're giving them the term up front. So they're getting 18 to 24 months already versus a traditional lender that's getting them 12, let's say. So it's already built into the loan up front. And uh, you know, for the most part, that program uh, has, has really worked for us. Kara, we appreciate your sharing some insight with us this weekend. Thank you for doing so. We'll pay a lot of attention to Farm Op Capital online, right? You can, a yep. farmer can yep. find you folks. Farmopcapital.com? Farmop.com. Farmop.com. Yep. We'll send them your direction. Thanks All right, for joining thanks us a lot. this week. Appreciate it. Here <clears throat> Reddick from Farmop. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pearson, we'll see you along the way somewhere. We'll, we'll be here with everybody next weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. So long, everyone. Have a great week. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.